Hi everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we will be doing a book review uh, of Understory. We read this over on my Patreon, the Discord server, for the book club that I run in September. So in this review, basically I'm going to kind of go over what I thought of the book, um, as well as include some insights from the people in the book club, um, some thoughts they shared on the Discord. So I'll quickly read you the blurb. This is a story of a tree change, of escaping suburban Brisbane for a cottage on 10 acres in search of a quiet life, of establishing a writer's retreat shortly before the global financial crisis hit, and of losing just about everything when it did. It is also the story of what the author found there, the beauty of nature and her own path as a writer. Understory is a memoir about staying in one place, told through trees. So this really is the memoir of Inga Simpson and her journey from Brisbane living in a city, one of the largest in Australia, to the Sunshine Hinterland, Sunshine Coast Hinterland, uh, where she lives on 10 acres and her aim really is to get back to nature and to get out of the city grind. And I think a lot of this book, what I got from it was, you know, this idea that I think Inga certainly had and I think I have and a lot of other people have of what it would be like to leave the city and go live in nature. And I think a lot of us think of it as like this beautiful retreat where we finally get to, you know, escape the rat race and it's relaxing and grounding and beautiful and magical. And I suppose Inga's story tells us that it is those things, but it's also not those things at all. It is so much work, so much work. And a lot of it's really heartbreaking, especially when changes start to happen to her space and things just don't go according to plan. The book is broken up into three sections. We start with canopy, then middle story and understory. And each chapter is named after or based on and starts with a different type of tree. So for example, the chapters are called bush brox, cedar, grey gum, rose gum, etc. And kind of vaguely the structure of each of these chapters is that we start with a description, quite a scientific uh, dry one of the tree that she's discussing. And then we sort of move into more of her experience of it. And then it moves more into just the memoir of, you know, the story that we're following with her and her journey. So through these description of the trees, we're kind of learning about the land on which she lives with her. One of the things I loved was the prologue. It really kind of set this tone that I was really excited for. She talks quite a bit about living as a settler on colonized land and what that kind of means and the uncomfortability she has with that, not quite knowing where she sits, which is something I've spoken quite a lot about, like this desire to connect with a land that is stolen and that your place on that land is, is oppressive in its own way. And so she kind of addresses that uh, quite clearly in the prologue, which I really, really liked. She says, somewhere at the heart of things is my unease at loving a place while knowing how I came to it and understanding that whatever connection I might feel lacks the depth of culture and language. Kind of connected to this, she also talks about how even the language that we use, um, and in Australia, the main language, the national language is English. And she talks about how this affects the way that she understands and relates to the land. She says, but English was born from a landscape far from here. My imagination through language and literature, symbolism and myth is rooted in Europe. And this is something that carries on throughout the book. She's quite clearly a big fan of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and Tolkien in general. So a lot of like the analogies she makes or connections to story are very much rooted in uh, stories from Tolkien, but also just English writers in general. She kind of goes on to say a little bit later, but I do not speak brush box. My imagination is wrong rooted in woodlands populated by elves and dragons, the store of words and images from a lifetime of reading English literature and a genetic memory of brooks, glens and munros. I strain to hear the voice of this place, the land itself. Sometimes when sitting on a log, straining up a slope or hopping from rock to rock along the creek, I catch its echo. Perhaps in time, if I listen carefully enough, all of the stories will align. So I really love that that kind of self-awareness and recognition comes right up front in the book. As an Australian, it was really nice just to read about places and trees and like ideas that I'm really familiar with. Um, here, even in Australia, we consume so much specifically American and British content in terms of television shows, movies, books, a lot of it. 
Um, and so it's almost, I don't know, it's almost funny. I really hear like the Australian voice come through. It's the same as when I hear like an Australian voice in a movie. It's really, it's almost jarring to hear my own accent in that context. So reading a book about which I was like, just that I was so familiar with all of these things um, and the language and the way that she was describing things was really, really nice for me personally. Having said that though, I don't think you need at all to be Australian to enjoy and appreciate this book. Laura from Aquamarine 18 definitely found parallels between the Australian experience and the Canadian experience, especially regarding colonialism. She said, as I'm reading the Cedar chapter with an image of the cedar open on my computer, I see parallels with what I know of Canada's history in terms of logging, clearing the way for colonial settlement and enriching Europeans. I feel like this book is a real mix of genres, a bit of historical nature and a little discussion on Lord of the Rings, dis definite political lens, all in one chapter in the best possible way. And that mix of genres is certainly something I and several other people picked up on too. As I said, we definitely start each chapter with a description of a tree, or most chapters, with a very specific description of a tree. And then we kind of float between a discussion or like a, a trip down memory lane with Inga about her experience and her journey. But that also incorporates some of her own history as well as like a true history of colonialism um, on the land uh, and how that might have changed or shifted the experience of that land, you know, for example, logging. She also does make an effort, especially towards the end of the book, it really picks up a big effort on educating us a little bit about the local Aboriginal culture. Um, so for example, just little things like the Aboriginal names of the trees or the locations. I think the very nature of the book had a lot of us reflecting on our own connection to whichever land we were currently living on. A lot of people started to bring up the history of the land on which they live many across settler nations and colonized nations but also i noticed that a lot of us were talking about you know what trees we were noticing um, i think it was really encouraging us to pay more attention to the trees and the plant life around us and people i i was one of them we even started like posting pictures of trees nobody said hey let's post pictures of trees but i think it was just you know a byproduct of reading this book and how how focused and mindful Inga was of the trees around her. It made us want to do the same. And Skyfit kind of echoed that. They said, I'm now beginning to look at the trees around my own house as if they are individuals with unique personalities. Philosopher Cat said, so far I'm really feeling both the poetry of her prose and the yearning to connect more with nature as a settler on stolen land. I was born here, but I don't know the names of the plants and trees to any depth at all. Not for lack of trying, but there's just this presumption here that their names and qualities don't matter, so it's often hard to identify familiar species. I'm prompted to do some deeper reflections on this. I really liked um, something Eris Elizabeth brought up, which is that uh, even as an Australian just living on the other side of the country, although she related a lot to this book in certain ways, the biome and her experience of the environment was actually quite different. Obviously they're related, um, but you know, for example, she said that, you know, they don't have koalas and yet koalas is something that Inga talks about a lot. So I liked having that reminder. Thank you, Eris. That even though this is an Australian book, um, Australia itself in terms of the environment is so diverse um, and it's a massive country, a massive island. So from the west to the east, they're very different experiences. There's also this tension that we spoke about in the Discord as well between Inga's experience of, you know, really loving the land and connecting with it and ultimately feeling like she really belongs there. Um, and at one point the idea of having to move arises and just that idea in itself is horrible to her. She really, really feels rooted in this place now. But there's also this difficulty um, that arises from the fact that a lot didn't go right. <laughs> there was a lot that went wrong throughout the book. Um, choices that perhaps were not the best to have been made or just came from a place of uh, not having all the information. Um, for example, uh, when they bought the property, they didn't know that power lines were due to be um, put up right alongside their property. Um, so stuff like that. And there's more throughout the book as we go along. But there's just a lot of this pain, I suppose, that knowing that as much as she's talking about this wonderful time in her life and how important it has been to her own development and her own experience, that there's a lot that went wrong along the way. And on this point, again, Laura from Aquamarine wrote, 
I'm feeling the author's struggle, I think, to write this boy book from a position of hindsight about projects that were really exciting, but that I don't think worked out as hoped, at least not financially. And I feel the pain there. I feel like it's remembering fondly, mostly, but with some definitely complicated feelings. So although there was this general sense in the Discord that we were enjoying the book, that we quite liked it, Eris loved it, but I think the overall um, consensus was that we liked it. I did certainly notice that there was a lot less discussion in this month's Discord than there was last month. And for me personally, I really didn't find this a page turner. I didn't find myself desperate to pick it up again. So it actually took me quite a bit to read because personally I just didn't feel that like compulsion to read it, which was interesting to me because I kind of thought I would. Um, so in that sense, it wasn't like this amazing book that I just couldn't put down. It was more, I think other people mentioned, it was more like this pleasant, relaxing thing to dip in and out of. Didi agreed with me. They said, like Katie was saying, I didn't find it to be a page turner but a nice companion when I wanted to go for a walk outside and get some fresh air. The way it was written was something to get used to, the very literal scientific way of describing the tree to start and then jumping into a personal or historical an anecdote. I found it to be disjointed and maybe part of the reason why I wasn't compelled to keep going at the end of each chapter. I will also agree with something else Dee Dee said um, when they kind of brought up this idea that Sometimes it felt like Inga was dancing around a topic, like she was definitely quite progressive in her politics in a lot of ways, especially as regard with regards to environmentalism and even like a, an awareness of, you know, the, the col colonialist history of Australia. But it often felt like she kind of just wasn't going there fully. Um, I think Dee Dee said it was like she wanted us to connect the dots on our own. Whereas there was this desire I shared where we just wanted her to say it. Dee Dee said, I was wanting a bigger discussion about the whole concept of owning land, owning trees, and why we have decided we can own living things. I think overall it was a relaxing read, but I grew bored or uninterested with the personal anecdotes. I wouldn't go that far. I would not say that I found the anecdotes boring or uninteresting. For me, it was more just this desire for her to kind of just be a little bit more upfront with us um, and kind of go there with those harder discussions. And it certainly felt that was underlying a lot of her frustration that she shared throughout the book and kind of this um, uneasiness and tension and even just straight up, you know, f like anger at situations. But she kind of never just went there with the discussion, which I would have personally really liked to have seen. I really liked what Laurie said actually about not particularly connecting with the author through the memoir sections, but more her description of nature. Laurie said, I found more of a personal connection to her by her descriptions of nature and her interactions with nature than with her story. I will say one of the things I personally found frustrating about the book, especially towards the end, was this, was this kind of judgmental tone, I suppose, um, where Inga was really, really critical of changes neighbours made to the land or, you know, government was making to the land. And I think with, you know, with justification, but then she'd kind of skim over her own changes to the land. So there was this little bit of, I don't want to say that she was a hypocrite, but there was just that element of, but just two chapters ago, you were angry about the neighbours doing that. Like, you know what I mean? So there was a little bit of that, especially towards the end of the book where it was okay for her to make changes to the land, but not okay for others to do so. But I definitely did kind of feel her struggle with, you know, the neighbors moving into a place and then wanting to put up fences and cut down trees. And it's like, why are you moving into this beautiful space to get away from the city if you just want to create all these barriers and kind of change the landscape that much. So it was interesting. It was this interesting kind of, I didn't quite know where I sat with that. And maybe Inga didn't either. Overall, personally, I would give this book three out of five stars. I really liked it. I enjoyed it, but it wasn't a page turner. I don't think it's a book I need, feel the need to keep or reread. It was just really nice, especially after our previous month's book that we just kind of didn't really like. So thank you so much to my patrons over on Patreon for reading this book along with me. A big extra special thank you to Tracy Timmerman, Laurie and Lynette Brown. The book we're reading next month is Waking the Witch by Pam Grossman. So this should be some fun. I'm really looking forward to it. If you'd like to join us, there is a link to the Patreon in the description below. But that's all I have time for today. I hope you enjoyed this review and I'll talk to you next time. So much love. Bye.